Okay, so many of us have been doing church, well, differently. Sunday mornings have become a bit more casual. Living rooms and coffee shops have become sanctuaries. And fellowship has a new, less personal touch. It hasn't been easy. Yet, here we are, gathering, worshiping, learning, being the church. Now more than ever, we're reminded of a simple truth. The church is not a building. It's the body of Christ. It isn't built with brick and mortar, but with faith and hope. In the midst of uncertainty, our calling remains the same, to share the truth of the gospel with a world God loves. Throughout history, the church has prospered in difficult times, and today is no different. We are still the church. We're just doing things a bit differently. Shake the ball. Hallelujah, you have done great. 
before you. Come on. The demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, demons you're the king of majesty, Lord. There is no power in hell. Come on. Or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. The great I am. The great I am. The great I am, Jesus, the great I am. So we sing, hallelujah, holy, holy, the God Almighty, oh, the great I am, who is worthy, Lord, none beside me, God. the great I am. Yes, you are, Lord. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, Father, to be in your house, to worship your mighty name, King Jesus. You alone are worthy of our praise, Lord. We sing this out. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. You're worthy. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Come on, church, can we lift up the name of Jesus this morning? Jesus, the name above every other name. The only one who could save. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. We live for you. Yes, Lord. We sing holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. Every song we could ever see, you are worthy, Lord, worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh Jesus, Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, you are worthy, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, we live for you.
morning we're trusting in you alone, Father. We're so thankful, Lord, to just be able to lift our hands, to lift our voice and worship you, Jesus. I will build my life. Come on, church. I will build my life upon your love. It is a Hilltop, whether you're joining us online for our 9 or 11 a.m. services or you're here live at our 10 a.m. in-person service, thank you for being with us today. If you're watching on Facebook, please make sure to share this video. I just want to make you aware of something you might not have heard of yet, that we are meeting in the house at Hilltop Community Church, 3118 Shane Drive in Richmond at 10 o'clock a.m. as a recent uh, decision by the Supreme Court has enabled us to do so. We're grateful for that. We've been praying for that, and we're excited to be able to be in the house. Again, we'll be practicing social distancing. We're asking everybody to wear a mask, and uh, again, we'll be no handshaking or hugging. Though we would love to do so, we'll do virtual handshakes and thumbs up and, and uh, virtual hugs. But again, we're meeting at 10 o'clock, uh, on Sundays at Hilltop Community Church. But for those of you who don't feel comfortable, we're going to continue to broadcast our services online through our Facebook page or YouTube at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Hey, Impact, we are so excited to be open for Sunday services moving forward. With that, we want to see and hang out with you safely, of course. We know so many of you have been wanting to see and hang out with your friends and that's why we are officially opening up the Vista Suite on the second floor for our 10 a.m. Sunday services. We hope you and your friends will choose to join us upstairs for service. We'll have the service available. The windows and the outdoor balcony area will be open, so dress accordingly. And we'll even have some pre-sanitized snacks for you guys. Remember to bring your mask and we're asking all students to stay six feet apart at all times. So, come on up and join us in the Vista Suite on the second floor. We would love to have you. Good morning, Hilltop families. I'm happy to announce our soft reopening of our kids' church. 
we want you to know that we are taking the necessary steps to ensure that you and your child is safe. We have made our areas appropriate to social distancing and have sanitizing stations as well as face masks available for kids and adults. Our nursery room for children from infant to two years old will temporarily be unavailable. Parents, please feel free to use our parents' room located on the third floor. This room will have our live service available to watch as you tend to your child. Due to county guidelines, we have adjusted our preschool, kindergarten, and elementary classes. Our preschool room for children ages three to five will be available on a first come, first serve basis with capacity of up to 14 kids. After capacity, we have activity packets for kids to enjoy available. We kindly ask that they sit with you in service. Our elementary room for ages 6 through 11 will be available on a first come, first serve basis with capacity of up to 14 kids. After capacity, we have activity packets for kids to enjoy available. We kindly ask that they sit with you in service. As a friendly reminder, our Hilltop Kids videos are available every Wednesday and Sunday on our Hilltop Community Church YouTube channel. Hilltop Kids Zoom available every first Wednesday of each month. We can't wait to see you and your family. I have great news. Once again, we are partnering with the USDA and CityServe Ministries to provide fresh food boxes beginning at 10 a.m. every Saturday in February. We are passing out boxes containing fresh produce, dairy, milk, and protein. Come as early as you can because supplies are limited. Hey ladies, the District Sweet Life Women's Conference is March 13th and 14th. The cost is just $69. Register at ncnwomen.org. This year there are two options. Watch virtually in the privacy of your own home or join a group of women at the House Church in Modesto. Friday night starts at 7 p.m. and Saturday is from 9 to noon. For more details, visit ncnwomen.org. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week either online or at 10 a.m. here at Hilltop Community Church. Good morning, Hilltop and our uh, affiliated parent, affiliated church in the bridge there. Again, hi to everybody out there at Berkeley. Again, we're so excited to be able to gather together, uh, even through this social media. And again, this is 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock that we're broadcasting this. But I also want to remind you that at 10, 10 a.m., on site at 3118 Shane Drive in Richmond, California, right across from the Hilltop Mall, we're meeting in our sanctuary, and that is a joy to be able to do so. And again, this last week, what a wonderful time. Our first service back in the house for many, many, many months. And uh, who would have believed it's been almost a year that we have been uh, having to do things completely different than what we would normally do. But again, we're so glad that you've chosen to be with us here today. And if you're coming in at 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock, again, we're, we're welcoming you. But don't forget, at 10 o'clock at our facility at, uh, at Hilltop Community Church, we're meeting in our main sanctuary. Thanks for our kids and our youth. We're practicing social distancing. We're masking and we have uh, a hand sanitizer stations all throughout the building. And uh, so we're doing all the, the things that we're needing to do, separating at least six feet from each other in our large sanctuary, which avail makes it available for us for that. But again, during this time, we would normally be receiving the Lord's tithes and offerings. And I cannot tell you, I know I say it all the time. I hope it doesn't sound repetitive, but it's heartfelt from my heart how much I appreciate your faithfulness and giving because it allows us to continue to reach out in our community, as you know that we've been doing through food distribution, but also not only in our community, but around the world, as this is a difficult time for missionaries, as many times they're not able to raise the resource that they would normally raise going from church to church and, and proclaiming the gospel. But now we have the opportunity to be faithful even in the these most terrible times. Thank you again for that. Again, you can give through hilltopcommittechurch.com or you can give through uh, uh, our 
text message. That's 510-223-2431. Or you can get a postage paid envelope and you can give that way where it won't even cost you postage. All you have to do is call the church to request it and we'll be more than happy to send them out to you. Again, let's pray before we get started in this, the fifth part of our series called Red Letter Edition. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you again for the privilege that we have in searching out the Word of God. And we thank you, Father God, that this Word transforms us. We pray, Father, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts. And then, Lord, not only that we understand and not only that we, we comprehend, but, Lord, that we will be doers of this Word, that we will manage our lives in such a way as to bring you glory and honor and to let ourselves be once again clay in your hand to mold and shape. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't know if you've ever really thought about it, but this would be the normal time in which I would be giving a message. And, uh, and again, I, I will be bringing a message, as we've said, Red Letter Edition. We're going to be looking again in Matthew chapter 5. But I'm not the only one who gives messages uh, during the message time. Now, if you were in our sanctuary, as many of you have been in times past, if you were in our sanctuary, you would know that um, uh, I'm usually in the front and I'm pro proclaiming a message. But, and, and I don't talk about this very much, but... While I'm giving a message there, it's been my experience that you, the congregation, uh, give many messages back to me. Uh, some people do it through facial expressions, uh, you know, as I'm speaking, and I can lock eyes with somebody, and I, I can see some, some people are wide-eyed and saying, hey, man, just lay it out here. I want to I wanna know everything you got for me, and, and, and I'm looking at those type of people. And then, then there's some people that are kind of give me the 50-50 look, you know, like uh, you got three minutes to hook me or I'm out of here. And then, then some people will have this kind of mean-spirited look on their face. You know, I don't know if it's if it's just a natural look, or sometimes it's sometimes I think, man, uh, it's kind of like the look that man, I even hate your mother, you know, type thing. But sometimes when I'm talking, I'll make an eye contact with someone and think, whoa, I hope that they actually made it through the metal detector at our front doors. No, I'm just kidding you. Uh, some people look really, really mean. And it's funny when we had our drive-in services and I'm standing at the top there preaching. And it's so odd to me that, that when we would be saying something that people appreciated, the only means in which for them to, to uh, uh, show appreciation was to honk their horn. Well, that's, it's a little unsettling to be up there and be the subject of somebody honking their horn because it doesn't usually have a positive meaning. Well, sometimes people will give me a message by their body languages. You know, certain people sit forward kind of expectantly leaning into learning. And other people have their arms crossed like this and say, well, we'll see. And when I get to a certain point in message, others kind of shift around and, and kind of look around like there is, is anybody else really buying into this thing? Or can we really believe this? And again, sometimes when you're a little bit bored and, uh, with what you're saying, you can watch all this stuff as a, as a public speaker. You, you know, uh, messages are a lot more interesting uh, when you're looking at what other people are bringing back to you than sometimes what you're saying, at least from my perspective. But after studying this passage that we've been looking at, the Sermon on the Mount, and what we call the Red Letter Edition, for many weeks, it, it seems to me that maybe the next section of this sermon that Jesus preached and that we're looking at today was prompted by messages being fed back to Jesus on the faces of people. Remember, Jesus launched this great sermon, probably the great, well, in my opinion, the greatest message anybody's ever preached in all of history. And he started saying the doors to the kingdom are wide open. Then he went on describing what life in the kingdom is going to be like. And he says, if you follow me, you're going to get some resistance. And, but he says, I will make sure that it's worth your while when we all get to heaven. Well, again, last week we watched a special testimony by Nabil uh, 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 Qureshi. What a great message that he, that he gave to us. But again, it was posthumously. And we got to see how everyday people like you and me can be salt and light. And we can spread the message of transforming power of Christ around the world if we're salty 
and were giving up the light of God, as Nabil did, even in his most difficult circumstances. But now Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, there's a kind of a total break in cadence and theme. It's, it's kind of abrupt, and it's, and it's unmistakable. There's been kind of a cadence going on, and all of a sudden, boom, it stops. Uh, maybe Jesus saw enough scribes and Pharisees in the group with that, I even hate your mother look. And maybe he saw some people with other kinds of looks, and, and he's saying, hey, I got your message. And, and so again, uh, he's saying, I'm going to take a time out and say a couple of things here, he says. And so in this section, he, he essentially said two things, just two things. The first thing he said was probably motivated by troubled looks on the faces of the Pharisees because he was saying some very radical things. They, they were, uh, those Pharisees were probably about ready to blow a gasket. And, and Jesus is saying, I'm not a loose cannon or a wild-eyed religious radical bent on discrediting and destroying the law and the teachings of the prophets that preceded me. In other words, Jesus was saying, I didn't come to abolish the law, but fulfill it. Now, again, let me remind you exactly what he said in Matthew 5, 17 through 19. He says, don't think I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the scriptures until all is accomplished. Whoever annuls one of the least of the commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying, look, I I know some of you scribes and Pharisees are really nervous about some of the things that I'm saying. But my mission is not to slam dunk or annul any, everything and everyone who preceded me. My calling is to demonstrate that all that they were pointing to and hoping for is coming to pass through me, Jesus was saying. Now, again, I could spend the rest of our time this morning explaining how Jesus was indeed the divine fulfillment of all what the Old Testament prophets were predicting. There were, uh, there were all these prophecies, over 300 specific prophecies about when the Messiah would come and who he would be and what he would be like and, 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 and where he'd be born, what kind of parents and setting he would, he would be in. in and and, and Again, it would be a fascinating study that I could take you through for a few moments, but uh, on how Jesus fulfilled all these 300 specific prophecies and how his death on the cross was the ultimate fulfillment of the foretelling and sacrificial system of the Old Testament. We could go on that odyssey, and I think you'd be fascinated by it because it's fascinated me over the years and still does. But Jesus was the fulfillment in the flesh of all of what the Old Testament was was pointing to. And he wanted to assure the Pharisees that he didn't come to slam, dunk, destroy, and put down the prophets. He was fulfilling the the, the predictions and and hopes and dreams of the prophets. Now, I'm not going to focus on that, really. We're going to save that maybe for another day. The second point I want to bring out that Jesus is bringing is that he pushes the righteousness bar up, way, way up. And I want to focus on the second qualifying statement that he makes at this point in the sermon. And again, let me read it for me straight from the book, Matthew 5, 20. He said to the rest of the people in the crowd, he says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness, morality, ethics, character, goodness, he says, exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let that sink in for a little bit. Because that was a bomb. It was just like taking a hand grenade and throwing it out into the crowd. The scribes and the Pharisees were the world record holders of righteousness. They had quit their daytime jobs, their jobs to do righteousness full time. I mean, you could call the Pharisees, they, you could say they were addicted to righteousness. Not only did they obey the scriptures, but also they made up several hundred additional laws to border, the, to border their behavior so that they could not get outside of the fence of righteousness. And then Jesus said to the rest of the people, unless your righteousness far exceeds their righteousness, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> wow. Well, a few years ago, actually it's been many years ago now, we had a staff member uh, on our staff who used to have a Nerf basketball hoop in his office. And I remember going into his office and picking up that foam ball, you know, the little orange foam ball. You've seen those things over the garbage cans and stuff. And, and uh, I started shooting. 
and it just from off the way, and, and boom, I hit like five or six in a row. I mean, with a Nerf ball again, you know, I, you know, he was impressed, you know, and I was mildly impressed by that op, you know, opportunity to do, and actually did. But um, he might have been impressed because I was a boss, but. But but it got me thinking after I hit like five or six in a row, I, I thought, man, what is the world record for consecutive free throws? Well, if you're a Warriors fan, you know that Steph Curry just missed the NBA record of consecutive, consecutive game free throws by 17. He did set a Warriors team record of uh, 80 uh, consecutive free throws in the games. And But Guinness world record of, uh, for consecutive free throws, uh, what do you think it is? 70, 80, couldn't be 80 because then Steph Curry would be that, but maybe 700, maybe 800. Well, did you know that the world record for free throws, consecutive free throws, is 5,221, and it was set by a gentleman named Ted St. Martin. He's the Guinness Book of World Record holder. This is back in April 28, uh, April 28, 19, 1996, I think it was. I mean, think about it. The next time you get six or seven free throws in a row, the next time you hit a thousand free throws in a row, you're about a fifth of the way there. (laughs) Why do I bring that up? Well, let's take the average guy out there popping free throws in his driveway who finds out that the Guinness World Record is 5,221. What would he say if Jesus came along and said, hey, the standard that I'm setting for consecutive free throws for you to hit is 10,000? And you'd probably say, well, you've got to be kidding. The world record is 5,221, and you're going to bump it up two times or much? I mean, if it's 10,000, here, take this basketball, forget it, I'm out. And that's the feeling in this text when Jesus says, I'm telling you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. What could he possibly mean? How high would that bar be? When Jesus says, I'm setting righteousness expectations, what is he saying? And again, I think I can give you some hints here of what he was saying, what he meant. Uh, These are hints that we're going to talk about in the next few weeks, really, uh, coming up. uh, And you don't want to miss those few weeks that are coming up here because it's going to be eye-opener for you. But in this next section, Jesus says, you are all pretty proud of the fact that you've never committed cold blood or murder. Probably none of you has a sword and gone out and stabbed someone to death. Between you and me, Jesus says, do you hate anyone? Is there anybody in your life who, you, who, 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 who can be classified flat out as a jerk? It's when you've already concluded that what that person is and you've thought of him as a jerk and you wish bad fortune would come his way. You don't like this guy or this gal, and when, when any opportunity comes up where, where you can harbor resentment toward them, you take full advantage of that opportunity. And Jesus is saying, is, is there anybody in your life like that? And then he says, most of you probably have never committed adultery. But he says, between you and me, do you think a lot about exciting sexual encounters with people other than your spouse or with someone else if you're single? Have you ever reduced a full image bearer of God to a sex object for your own gratification and then throw them away when your mental deal is done? Most of you probably tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth in the court of law. But Jesus says, can I ask you a question? Do you always tell the truth and keep your word in the course of daily life? Or do you say that the check is in the mail when you know it's not? Do you cut corners and say untruthful things? So, Are any of my hints helping you to see what Jesus means when he says, I'm going to set a standard of righteousness for you to fulfill that is higher than that of the scribes and the Pharisees? If you haven't guessed it yet, here's exactly what he's saying. Jesus is saying, no longer are righteousness tracking devices going to be strapped on the hands, feet, eyes, ears, and tongues of people in order to find out if they are in external compliance with kingdom standards of righteousness. He says, it's a new day. From here on out, righteousness meters are going to be strapped on the hearts of people. These righteous meters, righteousness meters or tracking devices are going to, going to monitor the true hidden conditions and true hidden motivations of the heart. That is going to tell the real story. And Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, external compliance to kingdom commandments won't be enough anymore. 
I'm just, I, I, I just am not going to be satisfied with outside compliance. Jesus says, I'm looking for people whose spirituality emanates from a radically transformed heart, a grace invaded core. Skin deep spirituality and cosmetic conformity to kingdom standards is no longer acceptable. I'm asking people to be righteous to the core. As we started this series, a hundred percenters. Righteousness to the core is 10,000 consecutive free throws. This heart theme is one of the hallmark themes in Jesus' teaching ministry. And you're going to see that in the next few weeks here. Everyone wants to debate with Jesus about the kingdom qualifications. They want to spar with him concerning kingdom cosmetics, Sabbath day restrictions, dietary customs, tithing, temple protocols, and, and the nuances of the Old Testament and those interpretations of it. Over and over, we see Jesus gently turning the focus of the conversation from a skin-deep level to a probing, heart-exposing level. Jesus wants to get it at someone's core and, and what's really going on in there. When Jesus gets there with people, it leaves them gasping for spiritual breath. Jesus says that it's all about the heart. Now, let me tell you two stories from the Bible that really bring this to life. The first one is recorded in Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50. Now, we're not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to summarize it for you, but the scripture's there, so you can read it later in your own Bibles, but, or you can turn and follow along with me. But there's this theology professor named Simon, and he can't wait to have a one-on-one -on -one intellectual and religious debate with Jesus. He thinks that he can slam dunk Jesus. He thinks he can just, boom, annihilate him. And so Simon invites Jesus over for a formal dinner at his house, and and has all kinds of trick catch-22 questions that he's going to pose to Jesus as a means of entrapment and perhaps embarrassment. He's excited by it, getting into this religious and intellectual slugfest with Jesus. And when Jesus shows up at his house, Simon forgets about all the rudimentary courtesies and proper greetings of the day, which is feet washing. They walked in, sandals on, dusty roads and, uh, you know, uh, all those dusty roads and stuff. And they walked in those sandals. And, and uh, so the customary rudimentary greeting when you were greeting somebody into your house was that you took their coat and you put their boots in a closet and, and their feet were washed. Simon said instead, hey, sit right down here. And he started asking the trick catch 22 questions. And then men point through the conversation an immoral woman. One translation actually calls her a whore. Walks in unannounced, this woman, and notices that Jesus' feet have not been properly tended to. And in a very moving way, she washes his feet. And when she does this, she's touching him. And Simon goes, well, that settles it. And he's ready to pounce on Jesus. And because one of the rules of the Pharisees was that you couldn't touch or even rub elbow, elbows with someone having a shameful sexual past like, like this woman obviously had. Here's Jesus allowing her to touch him. And Simon, has, he's got Jesus dead to rights. He's, he's just ready to pounce. But Jesus feels it coming and says, Simon, maybe you have something important to say. Before you bring that up, can I ask you a question? You're a theological professor. So let me give you an exam. There's a creditor and two people owe him money. One owes him a little bit of money, say 500. Another owes him 500,000. Out of the magnanimous spirit welled up with inside of him, the creditor decides to cancel both debts. Simon here is the question, which of the two debtors would be happiest? Well, Simon says probably thinking to himself, it's a trick question. And he's thinking about it, and his mind is reeling, and, he's, and he says tentatively, well, I, I suppose the one who's been forgiven the greatest debt would be the, would be the, the happiest. And Jesus says, I give you an A plus, Simon. That's very good. And Simon says, well, so what? And Jesus says, Simon, I knew why you wanted me over for dinner. You wanted an intellectual and religious alley fight to entrap, embarrass, and expose me. I know what this is about. You were anxious to get into an intellectual sparring match with me, but you didn't honor me enough from your heart to even greet me properly, to have a servant even wash my feet or, or even hang up my coat. 
There isn't an ounce of honor, esteem, or worship in your heart for me. Simon, this is the truth about your heart. While we were in this intellectual debate, a woman came in, Simon, and you saw her. Because we met earlier, I knew her past and forgave it. I do that. But let me tell you about her heart. Her, her, her heart is so full and exploding with worship to me that she washed my feet with her tears. Within her heart, she can't hold the fullness of emotion, that worship and gratitude that she feels for me. Simon, externally, hey, you look good. You're doing good. You're hitting 2,000 free throws. She has a past, and she can't, hit, and she can't even hit three straight. But because of the way the kingdom works, in my eyes, she just hit 10,000 free throws straight in a row. Her righteousness exceeds yours because she's righteous and worshipful to the core in her heart. Simon, it's a heart thing, Jesus says. Well, let me tell you another story. This one comes out of Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. And again, Jesus is invited to speak in a Jewish synagogue, but it's all for the wrong reasons. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees who invited him to speak in their synagogue, really, they don't care about what he's going to say. Uh, they invited him to speak in their local synagogue in order to set him up for a spiritual kind of sting operation. So here's how it worked. I'll give you a little background. One of the laws of the Old Testament was to honor God on the Sabbath. It's still one of the Ten Commandments. Remember, it says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do work. On the seventh day, set it aside to worship. In other words, don't work. And again, the Pharisees added 200 to 300 extensions of that law. I mean, you couldn't pick up a bucket or raise a certain size fork to your mouth because it was construed as work. It went to the point of the absurd. But one time, Jesus and his disciples were walking around and picked some corn on, uh, or wheat on the Sabbath. And, and this bent the Pharisees all out of shape. And they said, you're violating the Sabbath customs. And Jesus said, I'm honoring the Sabbath in the way that my father told us we should. True, I'm not obeying all your minute little deals. But they are your deals and not the father's deals. And that just infuriated the scribes and the Pharisees. And from that day on, they wanted to entrap him publicly, kind of a sting in public setting to catch him in a, some dramatic violation of Sabbath day customs. And that they, then they would have him dead to rights, so to speak, and, and they would able to be able to discredit his ministry altogether. So here's, here's what they did in this situation in Mark. Get this now. They invited him to speak at their local synagogue, and he agreed to come. And they combed the city to find a handicapped guy. Now, now picture this. They were walking through a city looking for someone with a disfigurement. Huh. And they found a guy with a terribly disfigured lower arm and hand wrist area. It was kind of... It was the kind of disfigurement that would make you keep your hand under the table every time you sat down to eat. It, it was the kind that would make you pull it up the sleeve of your robe whenever you were walking down the road. It was the kind where you would stick your hand on the inside where, where you, so that nobody could see. It was embarrassing. It was unsightly, withered, and shriveled hand. And they approached this guy and they said, hey, are we glad to meet you? We'd love to invite you to our synagogue to hear Jesus, the miracle worker, speak. We're going to arrange a front row seat for you, buddy. And of course, this guy is like, man, what a nice group of guys, man. But the truth is they didn't give a rip about him or his disfigurement. They were using him because they had a plan. You see, the day came and they stuck him in the front row, sure enough. And you know the plan. They, they, they said, Jesus is a sucker for disfigured people. He can't help himself. He'll heal him. And when he heals him on the Sabbath in the synagogue, we'll stand up and scream, that was work. And all of us will have him in clear violation of some of our rules. And then we'll throw the book at him. Well, the day came and the place was packed. I mean, Jesus coming in the house, it was packed. And this little guy with the shriveled hand was sitting in the front row. Sure enough, they arranged it. And Jesus got up to speak in front of the crowd like I'm doing now and speaking in front of you in this screen here. And he launched his sermon and saw that hand. <laughs> Whenever Jesus sees a disfigurement, whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological, in that day and this day, Jesus' heart 
he is stirred with compassion. And he saw this little guy risk slipping his hand out of his suit coat where Jesus might see it and heal it. And Jesus' heart was stirred with compassion. He was just ready to stop his sermon to do the healing when he became aware that every scribe and Pharisee in the room was salivating. They were leaning forward. If Jesus did the healing, they were ready to pounce on him and call it work. And he'd be in big trouble. Do you know what the scriptures record as happening at that very moment? In Mark 3 verse 5 it says, Jesus assessed the situation and was grieved and angered at the hardness of their hearts. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily the hardness of their hearts toward him because he expected that. It was the hardness of their hearts toward the guy that they dragged in. They didn't care about him. They were using him. It astounded Jesus that religious people could be that hard-hearted towards someone with a disfigurement. And Jesus said, look, we are in a religious facility existing supposedly for religious purposes. The place is filled with people who have religious de degrees and there's no love in this room. There are all these external accoutrements of spirituality but there's no love in the hearts of anybody in the room. It grieved Jesus that a church could be so devoid of love. So the moment of truth had arrived. What was Jesus going to do? He said, there is love in this room and love in my heart for that guy. Be healed, he said to the guy. And the guy was healed. At that minute, the healing took place. Everybody in the room stood up and screamed, Gotcha! The scriptures say that they, the, the scripture says that they emptied the place and went out back to plot how they were going to destroy him, Jesus. The place emptied in 15 seconds, leaving Jesus and the guy with the new hand alone there. I picture Jesus sitting down and the guy saying, Hey, it's a tough crowd this morning, huh? And Jesus probably would have said, well, you know, I hate it when this happens. Let me see your hand. So what are you going to do with your new hand now that you have a new hand? Tell me what your plans are. And I picture them, in my mind's eye, I picture them walking out together. It's like a, like a, a, a gal gets engaged and walks around with a ring finger out in front. Jesus had his arm and touched it, had his arm and, 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 and walked around with him and, and the guy's like holding his hand up looking at it like wow so what is the message going on there Jesus went after Simon the theological professor because he had this head thing going on but he didn't have a heart of worship Jesus went after the scribes and the Pharisees that day because they didn't have a heart of love one time Jesus was asked, another question, situation, how do you summarize what Christianity is? And Jesus says, that's easy. The essence of Christianity is when people have hearts that are full of love toward people and worshipful toward God because of what Christ did for them on the cross. That's being a Christ follower. That's Christianity. Well, friends, Jesus is here in your room right now as you're watching or in the sanctuary where we're preaching. Do you feel him? I hope you do. If he were here in the flesh and stood up in front of, a, a, the, a front of you at uh, church or in your, in your living room, wherever you're at, he wouldn't go around and check your spiritual merit badges. He wouldn't be interested in them at all, probably. Basically, he'd want to know if your heart is full of worship. Once in a while, do you get undone by what Christ did for you on the cross? When you hear a song or read a passage or, or hear a message, does something happen inside of you? Jesus would want to know whether your heart is full of worship and are you alive to loving people? Is that a fair description of your heart this morning? For some of you it is. I, I know it is. Your, your heart really is alive to worship and alive to love. You wouldn't think of missing an opportunity to be in God's house. 
this past week, I vis- not this past week, but several years ago, I visited a lady who uh, uh, was in a hospital. This is before COVID, obviously. But what struck me about her is that when I, when I got there, she cried many times uh, uh, because she was overwhelmed by her circumstances. Uh, but the thing that bothered her the most was that she couldn't be among the people of God worshiping God. <laughs> you see, when you love Christ, when you truly love Him, you demonstrate that love towards other people. Your heart is filled with worship and gratitude to God that He would come and save you from whatever desperation you're in and then He would call you to be salt and light. See, lots of you have had hearts that are alive with worship and love. You really do. But some of you don't. If Jesus were here, He would say, the game is over. Some of you have an interest in God that is casual at best and tends only to be intensified if you really need something from Him. You don't mind coming to church or hearing sermons about God, but your heart is pretty cold and unmoved by them. You hear that uh, worshiping God in fullness of heart, uh, lingering around the altars as we used to do on Sunday nights and and, but you're not moved by it. You really don't have an appetite for it. You're annoyed by it. Worship isn't alive to you and doesn't prompt anything in your heart when we talk about it. Some of you are not alive with love for people. As you get older, the truth about some of you is that you're becoming increasingly self-absorbed. The number of people you care about is shrinking and your focus is narrowing. And as time goes on, you're pretty self-absorbed and getting more so. Disfigured people, be they emotionally, physically, or spiritually disfigured. They don't stir up much of anything inside you except for a little irritation when they get in your way. Some of you say, there's no life that bubbles up inside of me when I hear about that. Well, if your heart feels lifeless, do you know what the problem might be? You might be dead, spiritually, and that's serious. But it doesn't have to remain so. Because God's word says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, even when we were dead, can make us alive to what Christ did on the cross. That text talks about the miracle of regeneration. It's when you get a new battery for your car. The brand new battery looks so good, bright, shiny, and a graphic on the outside that you want to put it on the shelf with flowers around it. The chemicals have been poured into it and it's all ready to go, but it's dead. It has the potential to start your car until it gets hooked up to an external power source and gets a jolt. It's dead. The car is dead. When it gets life breathed into it, then it's got something to offer and comes alive. When we come into this world, the scripture tells us we come in with a physical life until the miracle of regeneration happens through what Christ did on the cross. Our hearts stay cold and lifeless toward worship and really loving. It happens when someone says, I'm tired of being dead, cold and unmoved by God and people. I want to be alive in my spirit on the inside. And at that point, if you're open, if you open your heart and ask Christ through what you did on the cross, Jesus Make me come alive. The Bible says that everyone who calls on his name will be saved. He will. You'll be regenerated and your heart will change. And when your heart changes and becomes full of worship and love, that's 10,000 consecutive free throws in God's eyes. That's what it means to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Because you are righteous, worshipful, and loving to the core. Loving to the core. Unless your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, unless, again, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. I'd like to pray for you. This theme of a heart 
is consistent all throughout Jesus' teaching that our hearts will be soft and pliable before him. You see, Jesus knows what's coming for us. He knows the circumstances that we'll find ourselves living through. And all he longs for is your heart to be his. It's not looking for perfection, that somehow you turn over a new leaf and you become a new person and now you're the perfect person you always dreamt of being and now somehow you've acquired God's love because of your perfection. No, that's not what he's about. He's always been looking for people whose hearts were fully his so he could strongly support them. And it doesn't matter where you found yourself doesn't matter how high or how low you are in the world's eyes. It's your heart that matters. Today, would you do an inventory, a soulish inventory on your heart? Would you ask yourself the questions that we're going to be asking in the few weeks ahead about the realities of your heart? Don't miss a single message of this series because I'm going to challenge you as Christ has challenged me with his word. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, I pray for my friends here. Perhaps someone right now is feeling um, that they have, they felt like thrown in the towel, that they've messed up too many times and that there's no hope for them. I pray God that today they would realize that It's never been about the external compliance, though that happens when your heart is filled with worship and love for other people, but the perfection is not attainable. But our hearts being torn and broken before you and our humble admission that without you, we can do nothing. Today, Lord Jesus, I pray for my friends who come to that realization that today, They'll say from a heart abandoned from the self-improvement plan, a heart that is completely surrendered to the grace and the mercy that you offer to all. Lord, we would stretch forth our withered hand, figuratively speaking, and have you heal us. Make us new, fresh. Let our eyes be filled with awe and wonder. Let our spirits be filled with anticipation of once again being in your house and worshiping freely and giving you our whole hearts and loving each other. I pray, Father, that you would do this miracle in my friends here today as I ask you to do this miracle daily in my life. Do this miracle, I pray, Father. Transform us by the washing of your word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you for being with us here today. And again, don't forget, uh, at 10 o'clock in the house of worship, right here at 3118 Shane Drive in Richmond, California, across on the Hilltop Mall, we're gathering together. And again, we're going to be worshiping God, and we're going to be loving on each other, even if it's social distance love. God bless you. I hope to see you soon.